Hi, everybody. I'm Dr. Jared Scourin from Spectrum Awakening. Thank you for attending this talk at conference. It's one of the best ways to learn how to help your child. If you want to learn more, I just launched my first autism educational course, The Scourin Solution. Grab the 25% coupon in our booth and enjoy this lecture. Hello friends, thank you so much for joining me today. I am Dr. Mari Aceves and I am here on behalf of Autism Learning Partners uh, to talk to you about um, how we can incorporate ABA or Applied Behavior Analysis for a Calmer Home. Uh, this presentation was done in conjunction with Krista Gilbert, who was not able to be here today. Uh, to get us started, we'll talk just briefly about um, our learning objectives, kind of what the outline for our presentation is. And we'll start by talking about what Applied Behavior Analysis is, or ABA. We'll also discuss what strategies are used um, to increase independent responses and also for decreasing um, some of these behaviors that one we, we want to see less of. So this might be things like uh, tantruming, screaming, aggression, eloping, noncompliance. Um, and last but not least, we'll have uh, a quick conversation about family engagement. So important how we can keep the family engaged in our work together. So to get us started, let's talk about what applied behavior analysis is. And, um, you know, the, the technical definition of applied behavior analysis is that it's a science devoted to understanding and improving human behavior. Um, and uh, we, we do this by focusing on objective definitions of what behaviors are. Um, what does it look like? What does it sound like? Um, and we look at uh, behaviors that are typically of social significance, meaning that these behaviors tend to create a challenge um, in our ability to be independent and socially integrated. Uh, and, you know, what we like to do in, in ABA is we like to show that the work that we're doing, the interventions, um, you know, have a relationship to the progress that we see. So um, to do this, we use the scientific method. And the scientific method, you know, kind of has a process for how uh, to go about things. And so the first thing that we do is we look to see what it is that's, that we want to focus on. Um, what is it that we want to change? Do we want to increase the frequency of a behavior? Do we want to decrease the frequency, the severity, um, the length of a behavior? Right. Um, from there, we start to gather information that is useful for us to understand what's happening and help us understand what plan to move forward with. Um, and so through that, uh, through, through the data that we gather, we start to create, you know, a hypothesis. We start to formulate a hypothesis of how uh, we can create a plan, what we think is going on, how we think we can um, change the behavior, modify what's happening to get a desired outcome. And so what we are uh, doing here is really we're kind of taking down 
breaking down this uh, more complex behavior into uh, smaller functional parts, right? So we identify what we want to work on. Uh, is there a behavior that is a barrier to your uh, child or your family member's independence or socially integrated? We start to look at information and then from there we start to, to work on the, the plan. So we talked about gathering information and in ABA we do this by looking at what we called the ABCs um, or uh, also known as the three term contingency and the three term contingency is just a fancy way of saying let's look at the behavior from beginning to end. Right, so the A in ABC stands for antecedent. And so here we're looking to see what is happening, the events, the actions, the circumstances that occur immediately before a behavior, who was involved, what was said, when did it happen, what day, what time, where, where did the behavior take place? Right, um, the B is for behavior. So here we start to look at things that are happening. What can we see? What can we hear? So we focus very specifically on what we can see in here to try not to incorporate, um, you know, our own ideas of what's happening. So we really want to focus on things that are uh, objective. Um, to do that, we stick to things that are observable or that are audible. Um, and last, we talk about consequences or we gather information on consequences. And so consequences are the actions or the responses that take place immediately after the behavior. So this talks to us about um, how the environment, the people around the individual, how do we respond? Do we give more attention? Do we offer, um, you know, do we offer treats or a candy or a TV show when a child start to cry? Do we completely ignore the behavior? What is it that we do after the behavior has occurred? And so when we have, uh, have this information, it really helps us create um, and identify patterns of what is happening. Does the behavior always happen on Monday before school? Does a behavior always happen um, right before we transition off of uh, video games or an iPad? Right, so it really helps us to get an idea of what is happening. Um, and from there, we can start to get an idea as to what the function of the behavior is. And a function of a behavior is, uh, tells us about the reason why a behavior might occur. And it helps us plan for um, how, how to effectively respond to that behavior in the future. Uh, there are four main uh, functions of behavior, and they are access, attention, escape, and sensory. Access function talks to us about when we do something to try to get something. So, um, you know, most of us will go to work and we access a pay. Um, if I do X, I will get Y, right? So if I uh, say the, you know, I want ice cream, I might get ice cream versus if I don't, right? Uh, the next function is that of attention. And so this is when we do, uh, we engage in a behavior, we do something to uh, get uh, social interaction with someone. So this might be that I tap someone um, incessantly until they turn around and talk to me. Um, the third one is escape. And escape is when we do something in order to avoid a uh, engaging in a, in a task, uh, to avoid engaging with an individual. So something that we see commonly is something like we, um, you know, we will say something like, uh, you know, in two minutes, we're gonna be all done with video games and transition to, 
you know, something else. Um, and maybe uh, the individual engages in behaviors to try to avoid leaving that preferred task. So they might say, I would like more time. Um, maybe they start to uh, tantrum, maybe they start to um, be aggressive um, or run into another room. You know, these are different, uh, different examples of escapes. And last but not least, we have the sensory function. And here was uh, when we engage um, in a behavior because it just feels good. So for example, if I, you know, itch my head, nobody has to tell me, oh, that'll feel good. Um, it's just something that I either need input or have too much input, uh, sensory input. And so it, the, determining the function uh, is really important because it really helps to guide our treatment planning um, for behaviors that we want to work on. Uh, and the function of the behavior is, is important to identify for several reasons, right? So um, behavior prevention, um, we want to identify socially appropriate replacements, and also the creation of a behavior intervention plan is based on the function of the behavior. So when we talk about creating um, a behavior plan, one of the other things that is really important is to look at motivation uh, operations. So here what we're talking about a motivating operation is really um, a class of antecedent events that are going to influence the value of a consequence, meaning how somebody perceives it. If I, um, you know, offer someone who has had chocolate cake for the last month every day and I say hey if you do extra homework I'll give you some chocolate cake they might not perceive it to be very valuable because they've had a lot of access to that item or that reinforcer um, so these um, operations really uh, really influence the the impact that a reward will have on an individual, right? How likely we are to do it is based on how motivating something is for us. And when we talk about motivation, um, you know, we have to talk about reinforcement. And reinforcement is just, you know, essentially something that increases the likelihood that a specific behavior is uh, or a response will occur ag again in the future. So, um, it's reinforcement is very individualized. Um, if you have a an individual who loves Disneyland, they might be really uh, rewarded by access to uh, Disney movies, um, characters, Disney t-shirts versus somebody who doesn't care for Disney items. They might not be as reinforced right? If you have somebody who really prefers, um, who likes sweet items, who's a sweet tooth, um, and you say, hey, if you do X, Y, or Z, you're going to, you know, get access to um, some sweets, uh, some ice cream, a lollipop, you're going to get a very different response than if you were to offer that to someone who does not care for sweets at all. Right. So looking in, uh, at reinforcement is, is very, it's crucial that we are identifying what things motivate one person versus the other. And it's important to note that, you know, even individuals in the same home um, will like different things and that the same individual will cycle through liking things at one point and maybe a week or later uh, or two later that they, they're not into that item as much anymore. Also, when we talk about reinforcement, um, there are two different things that we, you know, can talk about. We talk about positive reinforcement, and this is um, basically the when we introduce something um, after a behavior occurs, right? Um, so this is going to increase the frequency of that behavior in the future. 
Uh, and so we have negative reinforcement. And this is um, the removal of something that we don't like to increase the likelihood of the desired behavior in the future as well. So one adds something that we like and one uh, removes something that we don't like. Also, we want to uh, talk about preference assessment and positive reinforcement. Um, and here, it, you know, it, it's so important that we're looking to see what is it that an individual is motivated by. Um, and again, it's going to change from person to person. It's going to change from from day to day, from week to week. Right. Um, we have some individuals that when we work with them, we'll start at the beginning doing observations. What are they playing with when we get there? Um, you know, can we can we observe what they're really like into lately? Um, maybe we say, hey, what do you want to what do you want to work for today? What do you want to earn um, at the end of your um, your five stars, for example? Um, and at the beginning, they'll say something and then halfway through, they change their mind, right? So it's really important to to um, take a few moments and, and really identify a reward. And you can do that by observing what an individual spends a lot of their time with um, or time on, right? So a lot of the times you don't really have to ask. You can just observe what the individual spends their time doing. Um, you can offer choices. You can say, would you prefer this or this? Um, you can ask the individual, hey, what is your most preferred item? What do you, what is your favorite thing today, right? And you can also ask other individuals who engage with that person regularly. So parents, grandparents, aunties, siblings, right? We can ask teachers and other caretakers as well to, to give us some input on what um, might be a really valuable reinforcer for that individual for that day, that week. So now, now that we have a little bit of an understanding on what those, uh, you know, basics of ABA are, let's talk a little bit about what applied behavior analysis or ABA looks like in the home. Um, and ABA is effective in any environment. Um, however, most of the work that uh, applied behavior analysts do is in home settings. And so it's important for us to talk about what that looks like and, and what strategies we use to bring ABA into your homes. Um, and so, uh, you know, ABA utilizes these strategies to decrease the behaviors that we, we want to see less of um, and to increase independence. So we want to uh, teach our uh, the clients that we work with some functional life skills. Right. And so some of the strategies that we use are environmental arrangements, proactive strategies and reactive strategies. So we'll start with environmental arrangements. Um, environmental arrangements really talk to us about the physical environment in the home. Right. So altering the environment to increase the, the likelihood that an individual is going to stay focused, follow instructions um, and reduce the likelihood of that behavior that we want to see less of. Right. Um, and so the way that we do this is we start by assessing for potential barriers. Um, so if we come into a home or a room and all of the uh, individuals favorite items are out easily accessible, we might say, hey, it's going to be really um, a little bit more challenging for us to get this person's attention if, if there's all these things they love around them at, you know, at a uh, arm's length. From there, we try to um, brainstorm and, and, and talk about like, how can we reduce these distractors? Can we remove any possible hazards from the immediate lo uh, location in the room? So if there is stuff all over the floor, um, that really creates a, a danger factor for slipping or tripping. So we'll try to create um, you know, a plan for how we can reduce the likelihood of those things happening. Um, and 
last but certainly not least, super important, we try to create a space for these rewards, these reinforces that we've identified to be out of the immediate reach of the individual. Because again, if the um, all of the favorite items are around um, and we say, hey, you know, first homework, then iPad, but the iPad is right next to the child, um, we're going to have a harder uh, time getting the child to stay calm in that transition, right? Um, and so here um, we want to um, we want to place th th these items that the, you know these rewards out of reach, um, not only to uh, to uh, streamline uh, whatever we're working on in. in decreased distractions, but also because it creates opportunities for communication, right? And, um, you know, particularly with early learners, not only with early learners, but a lot of our young, younger learners, we're working on a lot of speech um, and communication goals, uh, or not speech, excuse me, communication goals. We're, we're trying to get them to, to use their verbal communication or uh, sign language or in some way communicate to us they want something. And if the item is always within um, their access, it's going to be, uh, it's really going to decrease the opportunities for that. So here are a couple of examples of what, um, you know, environmental arrangements um, might be needed. So in this picture, um, we do not have any environmental uh, arrangements, right? So here you can see that, you know, one barrier might be that the reinforcers or the rewards, things that the child might like, are freely displayed throughout the area, right? Um, in an environment like this picture, withholding access to preferred items or activities is going to be very challenging because the child can just turn around and access something different. Of uh, environmental arrangement. So here, some of the highly preferred items can be placed out of reach. So you can see, you know, the, the stuffies that uh, this individual really loves are placed towards the top. Um, so there are less distractions and we create more opportunity for uh, communication. This is another example here where um, we could certainly use some environmental arrangements Right, so as you can see here, there are many distractors and many preferred items that are also readily and easily accessible. And so what we would want is to work towards uh, creating a little bit more of um, organized, uh, an organized area where um, we use shelves or bins where highly preferred items can be placed out of reach. So this is another example where environmental arrangement has taken place. So um, the next thing we'll talk about is uh, the proactive strategies. So proactive strategies um, are things that changes that can be made ahead of time. Um, and the idea is that when we create these changes ahead of time, we're going to minimize the likelihood that a behavior occurs or, you know, decreasing the duration or the severity of, you know, the behavior that you're working on. So some of the uh, proactive strategies that we use are the PREMAC principle, um, the pri uh, priming or first then, um, and uh, Sorry, pre-MAC principle is first, then uh, priming, so we give a warning, and then three is offering choices, right? So when we look at the pre-MAC principle, this is when we are going to, um, we, you know, access to a preferred item or an activity really depends on engaging a particular, in a particular behavior. So we uh, say things like, first homework and then iPad, um, first finish dinner, then ice cream, right? First finish 
a page of homework than you can watch TV. So um, we do give access to the preferred item. It's just really, we, we, we withhold it until the activity, the task that we ask for is complete. So these are some uh, visuals of what it would look like. You know, we have um, a first then uh, little uh, squares and you can, you know, include, you know, you can use tape or, you know, different icons. You can write it in for, for you know, uh, uh, for individuals that don't need a visual um, and prefer words. Um, so here you can say, you know, first library book and then iPad, uh, first, um, you know, seat work and then uh, you know free choice so this is an example of what um, you know that pre-mac principle might look like in your home uh, next we talk about priming and priming is just basically giving a warning or advance notice of something that's coming up and and we do it in everyday life you know later this week we're going to go to grandma's house after school i'm going to pick you up to go to the dentist um you know so it just it's just a heads up um, and it helps us to prepare individuals by giving relevant information so that we can prepare, right? Imagine that I just came to your house and said, hey, get in my car. You would not know what to do. You wouldn't be prepared. But if I said, hey, I'm going to come to your house tomorrow at eight and we're going to go on, um, you know, a trip to the beach, bring your blanket, bring some lunch, bring, um, you know, a beach ball, um, you might feel more prepared. Um, and Priming, like I said, we, we do it verbally very often, um, but it can also be done with schedules or, uh, or with visuals. And so if you use a planner or the um, calendar app on your phone, that gives you a warning before you know, your appointment, that's priming. And some things that you might see in your home might be a visual schedule like this, where we have a list of things and it might include the drawings or not, depending on um, the client that we're working with, just to give them an idea of what their time structure is going to look like. This is another example, right? First we wake up, then we do this and this, right? So it creates an outline for the way we're going to spend our time. Um, next, we will talk about offering choices and offering choices is um, another way, um, in, another proactive strategy, another way that we can, um, another change we can do ahead of time, another strategy we can do ahead of time to, to help um, to help with behaviors. And so this is where we allow individuals to Tell us what they want to work for, to indicate their preferences for items, for activities, for people. And what's important here is that when we're offering choices, we want to make sure that um, it's the individual chooses, right? Oftentimes we say we're giving choices, but then we don't really give the reinforcer or the item that the person chose. So we want it to be person led. Um, and the second thing that is important in talking about offering choices is that we want to make sure that we um, are able to have shared control, meaning they get a part of the reward, they get a part of the thing they want, and we're able to control a part of it as well. Um, and here, um, a really easy example of offering choices might be, do you want to watch TV or do you want to play outside after homework? Do you want iPad or do you want to play a board game, right? Um, would you like to have a, uh, a banana or would you like to have an apple? So those are some uh, ways that we can use offering choices. And so, here is a uh, something that you might see in your home that will help us um, keep uh, that will a visuals are a really good way of of helping individuals keep in mind what they're working for. And so you can see down here we have a choice board so they can um, choose from the uh, 
the, the choices down here, what they are going to earn after finishing their tasks. Um, I should have said cupcake instead of uh, instead of banana, but this is a visual of another uh, way to offer choices. Which which would you choose? Now let's talk a little bit about reactive strategies, my friends. Um, and in reactive strategies, uh, so we talked about proactive strategies, right? The things we do before. Uh, in reactive strategies, we talk about planned responses, planned actions um, as a response to a particular behavior, and they can help minimize the severity, the duration, and the frequency, right? So we want to have a planned response when the target behavior is happening. And so some strategies that we'll talk about that are useful um, are uh, number one, differential reinforcement. So um, rewarding behaviors differently based on the effort, right? Um, we'll also talk about redirection. So this is where we guide um, an individual to a different task. Um, and number three is follow three. This is so important. So uh, for follow through, it's when we say first this, then that, when that contingency is established, we really want to make sure that we are sticking to it. So we'll start with differential reinforcement. And differential reinforcement is um, rewarding the behaviors that you know we want to, to see. Um, and it depends on, um, you know, the the amount of effort. So, um, for example, um, we want to make sure that we are uh, providing uh, a reward um, for an individual who says the phrase, can I have a phone, right, versus just pointing to the phone, right, um, or just grabbing for the phone. Um, so it's really important that we provide a uh, motivation, we provide reinforcement or reward when we're trying, uh, when the individual is trying. Another uh, common example here is when we have, for example, um, you know, young toddlers who are first just learning to to walk or to talk. Um, we give them a lot of attention for just trying to say a word or for taking one step, right? Um, and so, uh, and as they get a little bit older or more fluent, um, we don't give as much as attention, right? Um, so those are some examples of differential reinforcement. Uh, the next topic here is redirection. And here is when we um, redirect, when we guide an individual to a task. So um, let's say that you have said, hey, you know, um, it's time to clean up. And um, the individual says, um, you know, your, your child starts talking about um, something that happened to school and they continue to play. So we would redirect them to cleaning up or, you know, um, if we're working with, um, you know, older, uh, with teenagers or, um, you know, uh, adults. Um, and um, we say, hey, it's, you know, it's, it's time to uh, shut down uh, the iPad or it's time to put down the phone, it's time for bed. And they start talking about how there's this thing they really want to finish first. We just redirect them. Hey, um, you know, it's time to go to bed, put the phone away. Um, another example is if an individual is, you know, tapping the pencil on the table instead of doing homework. Um, we would say, hey, you know, write it on your paper, right? Use the, use the pencil to write down your answer or something like that. So we just bring them back to a task that you want to see complete or that they were prompted to complete in the first place. Um, last, but again, certainly not least, follow through. So, so, so important. When we have a contingency, we want to make sure that we are seeing it through. So what often happens is we say, um, if you don't do this, then I'm not going to do this. Or if you don't, you know, finish um, your food, then you're 
not going to be able to go outside all day and then we you know are not able to follow through on that so we want to be really careful with the words that we're choosing with the things that we're saying um, and making sure that when we say you know if you're not going to do this and you're not going to do that um, that we're able to stick to it so um, a good example is that we might say that, you know, TV is only available after one page of homework is complete um, and that we stick to it if that's what you said. Uh, sometimes we allow kiddos or um, individuals in our life to uh, continue with their uh, reward receiving um, that reinforcer, um, even if the task wasn't done. So it's really important that we follow through because it sets the stage for, for future behavior. Now, how do we put it all together? Um, you know, it, it's it, because there are so many things happening in our homes. There are so many behaviors, so many skills that we could work on. We really want to, um, you know, kind of hone in and focus on what we want to work on first or in this moment. Right. So we want to identify um, what skills or what activities we want to practice. And so from there, we want to set up our environment. We want to get our environment ready. Right. We want to uh, try to minimize distractions so that we can stay focused on the learning. We want to identify that reward. What is going to be motivating for your child, for your family member? We want to create those rules and expectations. This is how you can access your reward. So we're not completely removing. We're saying, yes, absolutely, you can access this. This is the way to do it. Um, we want to give guidelines for gaining access to the reinforcer, right? So we want to make sure that um, we give them ways to be successful in contacting that, that item. If the uh, you know behaviors start occurring, we want to redirect. We want to bring them back to the task, and we want to follow through. And from there, when the uh, task is completed, the activity is completed, we always, always, always give the reward. So we do not want to be in a situation where we say, "Hey." You know, if you do the homework, then you can have TV and say, oh, you know, it's too late for TV. You have to go to bed. We always want to make sure that we're following through. We're providing the reward. We're, um, you know, if you think about, you know, a, a, an individual who goes to work um, and they're getting their reward is money, their paycheck. Um, you know, how would you feel if you went to work and didn't get paid? Right. So we want to make sure that we give um, access to their reward. Now, um, what we can do in um, in putting all of these together and creating these uh, treatment plans is using um, applied behavior analysis um, to teach functional skills, right? Um, and some of these things include things like uh, bathroom hygiene, um, getting ready for bed, and play skills. on um, in the home setting um, when you use these you know uh, when you use ABA to to work on these functional skills um, sometimes these challenging daily tasks can become much easier so um, when we work on things like potty training um, we you know our first step would be to create a schedule or a plan for potty training opportunities, right? We want to identify the reward. What is it that we're going to give our uh, kiddo when they use the potty? Are we making sure that that reward, that item is not within reach, right? Um, and from there, we might use the PREMAC principle, right? Um, so let's say that you've decided that, you know, we're going to the bathroom every 45 minutes or every hour. Um, we're going to stick to that, right? We're, we've identified the reward um, that we're going to give the child when they avoid in the restroom, right? So we want it to be something really that they really love and something so motivating. Um, so from there, we might say something like first go potty in the toilet, then you get your gummies, then you get, you know, this particular YouTube video. 
Um, and we want to make sure that we are priming the individual when we're going to transition into that activity. Following through when we do um, create that contingency, like we talked about, super important that if the child goes potty in the toilet, we give the gummies, meaning that we have the gummies or whatever the reinforcement is, um, we have them available and ready. Right. Um, and it's important to remember that this particular reinforcer, so the gummies in this instance, um, cannot be given to the child under other circumstances because it's the reward that we are re uh, reserving for this particular activity. And typically when we have a more challenging activity or skill to learn, we really want to use the highest preferred item, their most preferred item to really uh, increase that motivation right? Um, we want to make sure that we're consistent and able to stick to our plan um, because in ABA, consistency is absolutely everything. Um, oh, excuse me. We'll also look at functional uh, skills in uh, nighttime routines. So here, um, you know, kind of similar to what we talked about, like what do we want to work on, right? Outlining the plan. Um, and uh, bedtime routines can consist of many different steps, um, some that are easier to maneuver, some that are not. So it's important to identify what it is that you want to work on, um, to identify the steps that you want to be completed, right? Um, so we want to make sure that we are starting simple and with the crucial aspects of that nighttime routine for that particular individual. For example, we might um, talk about brushing teeth, right? Um, or um, and then changing into pajamas. Um, so those might be the two steps that you're going to be working on with your child. Um, so in this situation, visual supports might be really effective or words that um, describe each step might be really helpful in outlining that plan. Um, from there, we can offer choices between items being used during the, the, the routine. So maybe um, your child is able to pick the pajama they get to wear, or you have different types of uh, toothbrushes, different colors that they can use. Um, from there, we want to make sure we're checking in with our environmental arrangements. Um, do we have all of our toys and other preferred items out of reach so that when it's time to change into our pajama or brush our teeth, we are not distracted by other things, right? Um, if there are other reinforcers, other um, items within reach through you know, the immediate environment, it could really be a barrier for following through with the routine and, and create extra steps. Right. Um, we want to make sure that we um, use priming to let the individual know when bedtime routine is going to occur um, and use our pre-MAC principle um, as needed. Right. When the uh, reward is going to be available. So first pajama, then brushing teeth, and then I will read your favorite book. Right. Um, and redirecting when necessary. Um, making sure that we're uh, guiding the, in the, the individuals um, back to the task that you've prompted. And just like before, when we create that contingency of first, then we want to follow through. We want to we want to make sure that we uh, stay consistent and provide that reward only when the bedtime routine is complete. Um, next, we have functional skills uh, relating to play. And so um, here, you know, this can go in so, so many ways. Um, it, but, you know, just like before, we want to identify what skill do we want to work on? What do we want to practice, right? What is it that we want to teach? Um, so, for example, we could focus on teaching the client to play with a um, and here we would use environmental arrangements by placing any other preferred activity out of reach so that the only materials available are, um, you know, the puzzle pieces. Uh, so before presenting the puzzle, um, 
you know, this particular activity, we would identify what is it that we're going to reinforce? How are we going to reward after completing the puzzle? And here we might, um, you know, we're going to uh, prime the individual again of the, the play expectations, right? So we're going to um, get them ready, let them know of what, what's going to happen. So we might say something like during puzzle, we place the pieces together until the activity is complete. We keep puzzle pieces um, on the table. Um, we keep the puzzle pieces in our hands, not in our mouths or, you know, something like that. Um, so from there, um, we would use our pre-MAC principle to show when the reward will be available. We want to make sure that um, the um, your child knows when their reinforcement is coming. So you might say something like first puzzle, then bubbles, first puzzle, then iPad. Right, and just like before, we want to make sure we are following through and that the reward is available only after the activity is complete. When we're looking at uh, daily living, um, we really want to make sure that the environment is set for success. Right. Um, and here is an example of transitioning from video games to another activity that might be less preferred. So our environment is going to be really, really important. Right. We want to make sure that um, all other reinforcements, our reinforcers are placed out of reach and only the necessary materials are present to minimize these distractions. Right. From there, we want to, um, you know, set up uh, a reward for following instructions so we can offer choices. Um, we can ask the individual what they would like to play with after the activity is complete or what they would like to do for dinner. Um, from there, we would uh, prime. Uh, to provide notice of the transition, right? We want to make sure we are letting um, our kiddos know, our family members know what is coming up next. Using the first N or our pre-MAC principle to let them know what's going to happen, right? So first you have to do a page of homework and then you can have video games, right? Um, or you have two more minutes of video games and then we have dinner, right? So following through with that transition of turning off the game once the time is, uh, the specified time is up is really important or placing the controller out of reach or taking out the battery, you know, whatever it is, but following through is really important. Um, another thing is that it's important not to add any additional demands once your contingency is established. So let's say they have done a great job with completing, you know, the homework, one page of homework um, and then they get the video game, you're not going to say, oh, just one more page, just two more pages of homework, right? If they did what you asked to do, we would make sure that they get their reward, um, that we follow through the contingency, right? Super, super important that we stay consistent in how we provide that reinforcer. And so now, friends, now that we've talked um, about the different strategies, how it shows up, how ABA shows up in your home, and what kind of, you know, uh, different scenarios we, we use um, these strategies, let's talk a little bit about family engagement. And this is so, so important. In ABA, um, you know, you have uh, different people on your team. You have a behavior technician, you have maybe a mid-level supervisor, you have a BCBA, um, and you have, you know, the different members of your family. Um, the head behavior analysis or ABA team are there to sort of get the ball rolling, right? Um, but we are there only for a small fraction of the time. Um, our, you know, the family members are there 
full time. And so it's really important that we're able to increase that family engagement and be able to um, find a way in which all of these activities and strategies can fit into your daily living. So we suggest that you start small. Um, there are so many things that we want to work on, so many things we want to teach. Um, we want to start small. We want to start on what we can follow through with. So we want to pick a couple of things that are sort of priority that we're going to focus on that we know we can really follow through and go from there. That will really allow us the ability to access success, not only for our, um, you know, our family members, but for us as caretakers as well. We will feel good about the ability to get our kiddos um, or our, you know, siblings or family members to complete a task or to become more socially independent, more socially integrated. But it's by starting small, we want to take baby steps. We also want to pick fun activities to do together that, you know, we're just doing for fun. We don't always just want to be working, working, working all the time. We want to make sure the things that we choose are fun for everyone involved. So, yes, we want to check in for what motivates that child, that client. And we talked about shared control. We also want to have a piece of that ourselves, right? So we want to have... Um, times uh, throughout the day, throughout the week, when we're just hanging out, when we're just, you know, doing fun things, when we're just relaxing and enjoying each other's company. Um, we also want to make sure that uh, when these skills are showing up, we, we praise, we reinforce, we reward, um, you know, so we have the uh, phrase here of uh, catch them being good, right? So even when we're not looking, even when we've not prompted and the um, child is engaging in a skill you want to see more of, um, you want to make sure that you acknowledge and reinforce. Also, um, we want to model expectations. So very often we'll say things like, you know, no yelling in the house, but we're yelling. Um, and then we, you know, kind of get upset at our kiddos for engaging in, you know, high or raised voices. So we want to make sure that we're checking in to our nervous system, that we're checking in to see how we are responding to um, different situations so that we are really able to give examples of how we want, um, you know, individuals in our home, our clients, or our, our kiddos to, to behave. Um, and also, it's important to note that um, the most important thing in learning is consistency. Um, even if we have to model often, even if we have to practice a skill for a long time, that's okay. Consistency will get us there. When we're not consistent in the delivery of reinforcements, when we're not consistent in how often we practice a skill, that's where we run into trouble because we now have prolonged the progress of a behavior. We've now prolonged the ability to learn something a little bit faster, to practice something. So consistency is absolutely everything. And that's why it's, uh, you know, we do recommend that we start with smaller items because they're easier and more digestible. From here, friends, um, some strategies that we offer you are that um, engage and you prioritize self-care for you. Um, very often, a lot of our day, a lot of our time um, is spent around the needs of the individuals we care for. Um, and so uh, we don't take the time to make sure we are rested, we are eating well, that we have a few minutes to decompress, to do something that relaxes us. Um, and this is really important, not only for our uh, well-being, um, self-care also 
ensures or helps to uh, ensure that we are able to be present at 100% of ourselves, that when we're responding to a behavior, we're doing it with patience, that we're doing it with understanding rather than with impatience or we're in a hurry or, you know, um, we're upset at something else and we have a short fuse. So taking care of ourselves and uh, really allows us to care for others. Something else that is important is networking, um, checking in with individuals at your um, children's schools, um, at different programs in your community. What, what is happening? Are there support groups in your area to, um, to, to create communication and, and check in with families that are experiencing similar situations as you, right? This also can help um, networking can help create opportunities for more learning. So um, social skills groups, going on play dates, going on outings to the park with individuals that um, have similar, uh, similar needs. And the last thing that um, we want to offer to you is um, documenting your journey. So checking in to see, you know, whether it's journaling or looking um, at progress reports from your ABA company, um, checking in to see what changes um, have happened throughout your time with um, your, your ABA uh, providers or your ABA journey. Um, you know, often we, you know, we're very focused in the present and so it can take a little bit of time to be like, oh yeah, you know, two years ago we were working on something completely different. So documenting our journey and checking in to see all of the gains can be really encouraging when we're feeling, um, you know, really depleted. So um, we've come to the end of our conversation today, my friends. Um, thank you so much for, for being here. Um, in summary, um, you know, we know that it takes a lot of work um, to 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 do the the things that you do to provide um, all of the love and care for your family members, um, and often we you know we really want the skills to come faster. We want the behaviors to reduce. Um, so that, you know, the people that we love can be independent. Um, and again, we can, with consistency, we, we certainly can get there. Um, you know, just reminding you that we have to be patient and allow our, uh, our family members to learn at their pace. We want to give ourselves grace as well, um, knowing that if we are consistent, we can certainly get there and always celebrate the wins. Instead of, um, you know, focusing on only the things that we're still missing, the skills that we still don't have, try to celebrate the things that we do have, the skills that we are learning. Um, celebrate the wins, whether they are, you know, usually we, we celebrate the big ones, but celebrate the small ones as well. Um, and with that, my friends, um, on behalf of Taka and Autism Learning Partners, I thank you so much for your time. Um, I am going to show some references that appeared throughout our presentation. And until next time, my friends, um, I hope to see you again. Thank you.